morning, everyone. Um, let me begin by saying that I'm going to draw on, on work done with several co-authors, and the usual caveat applies. Any, any distortions of their work are, are entirely my responsibility. Um, just to put the context of this, the, the other presenters are talking about very specific things in, in South Africa, in, and I think my presentation is really providing a, a, a background, um, a context within which their more detailed analysis, and particularly James's, takes place. Um, I'm going to be concentrating, although we're talking about um, emissions, I'm going to be concentrating on CO2 emissions throughout this talk. I won't say much more about that. Uh, I was wondering how I'm going to get through all of this, and one way is to get the chairman to preempt what you're going to say. Um, so let me start with what, what Constantine's already said uh, about what I call South Africa's uh, climate change dilemma. It's the same dilemma that all developing countries face, uh, but in, in many ways it's a much sharper dilemma because the problems are much bigger on, on both sides, on both the development and the climate change side. So South Africa faces enormous development challenges. Uh, some figures there for you. Um, Obviously, the consequences of these immediate things, unemployment, poverty, inequality, the, the social, the moral, the political consequences are enormous. Uh, and on, on the other hand, South Africa is a, a, a dirty uh, energy user. It, it's, uh, as Constantine said, it's a big emitter. It's actually the 13th largest em emitter of CO2. Uh, in the world in, in absolute terms. Um, it's, it's got, it accounts for 1.4% of global emissions, uh, although it's 0.7% of the world's population. So it's, it's a uh, country with very large um, <coughs> development problems and very large uh, emission problems. Uh, governments uh, in Copenhagen committed itself to 42% reduction uh, against baseline in, in uh, 2025. But this is very difficult to manage, both technically, how, how do you do it? And one of the things we'll be looking at later he has with carbon taxes, I think with Alison, the, the issues of, of electricity generation, which main source of, of uh, these emissions, it's technically difficult to do. Um, and how do you manage this without uh, damaging uh, development uh, efforts and so on. Uh, that's the problem we all face, all developing countries face, is there a trade-off between, between these things and governments, as in South Africa, talk about green growth and green jobs and trying to, trying to put a, a good, a positive side to it, but, but um, it's, it nevertheless is a problem. And there's a political challenge. Obviously, uh, we, we get from a lot of the work, there's the usual business challenges, uh, concerns about competitiveness. If you make, uh, uh, if you pay, if you internalize the externalities of, of carbon emissions, uh, firms say they're going to be disadvantaged. Uh, unions and labor are concerned about uh, um, reduced employment, and we're concerned also about impact on the poor of, of any measures. One way of looking at this is very aggregate level. Here, we, uh, just a, a little decomposition that we, uh, we've done. Um, looking at the emissions per head, you can break that down in a, in a fairly straightforward uh, way into um, the, the, what uh, the World Bank calls the carbon CO2 intensity. How much CO2 is related to the, your, the energy you use? How much energy do you is related to the GDP you produce and what is your GDP per capita. And we can break down into these components. And you can see South Africa, it emits nine uh, tons of CO2 per person per year. That's, a, uh, that's high relative, if you look at the bottom of this table, developing uh, sub-Saharan Africa is less than a ton. Uh, so it's an outlier in, in, in Africa. And you can see that this is broken down Mainly, if, if you compare South Africa with the rest of the world, the world average income, it's pretty much the same income per capita. Uh, it's much dirtier. Uh, 
They, the energy they use issues more CO2, and they use more energy per unit of, of uh, GDP that they, they produce. Uh, one can play around with these figures and say, and do things quite, quite simple to say, if South Africa had Japan's technology, what would its emissions be? And you'll, fi you'll find it goes down roughly by 75% or so. If, if it had uh, Japan's GDP, it would be producing uh, three and a half times as much uh, emissions per head. And you can get some idea of this aggregate. Where, where, what's driving this? Now, this uh, decomposition helps us to think about um, uh, co low carbon development. Just a, a very quick uh, general impression that we get. Uh, on the right hand side there, as income per head rises, on, on the right hand graph, you can see energy use goes up. Uh, to produce more, uh, you need more stuff, to, uh, more inputs, and particularly more energy inputs. Uh, and, and we see a long term, uh, uh, sorry, we see this a cross sectional set of data. Uh, you, you'll see how, how, how that's a fairly straightforward relationship. On the left-hand side, as, as income per capita rises, we tend to see energy use getting dirtier. The energy used is dirtier, and after a while it starts coming down again. Whether that's because of efforts, uh, technological change in, in, developing country, in developed countries, or because of efforts to clean up the environment or whatever, uh, we, we needn't get into. But there's that, that sort of relationship. If we go back to uh, the decomposition again, um, we can see the development targets, basically we are talking, they entail, and no matter what we think about it, they entail rising GDP per head. Uh, and therefore, to reduce emissions, we either have to reduce the uh, energy intensity of, of production, uh, produce things more efficiently in terms of energy, or we have to have cleaner uh, energy, or both. We have, to, we have to do, we've got no choice about, about that. It's an accounting uh, relationship. Um, this requires we, we make technological changes. We find more efficient energy technologies or cleaner energy technologies, um, which can take time. It's, it's, it's something which, for many developing countries and for South Africa, uh, these are, uh, the technologies are not necessarily developed uh, locally and it's a question of technology adaptation. So the, the other thing is to change the composition of production. Can we switch to uh, pr producing goods that require less energy or producing things that have cleaner energy? To examine the potential for, for this latter option, we did some work uh, looking at disaggregating this, this decomposition a bit more and going into the actual products. What is the carbon content of, of products uh, produced in South Africa and what are the possibilities of shifting around? This is actually something that's important for thinking about what the impact of carbon tax is going to be. Which sectors will they hit will depend upon which ones are, are most uh, carbon intensive. Now there's a fairly standard way of, of doing this. Uh, we we uh, did some work, and uh, you can see the, the reference there. Um, fairly standard way using input-output analysis. We want to look at the carbon content of products, which is what most input-output analysis focuses on. We use a technique which also distinguishes between products and sectors. Sectors are fairly aggregated things, and they may produce a wide range of products, each product having a different kind of carbon content. And so we, we look at that. And then we look at the relationship between carbon and exports, the sort of thing that the business sector is concerned with, carbon and em employment, uh, the sort of thing that unions, and carbon and households, the sort of thing that we're concerned with with poverty, does it impact on the poor. Um, the, uh, the methods needn't go through this too much, but it, we're basically using a supply use table uh, method of sort of extension, actually a precursor in many ways of, of input output. Uh, where, we, where we pump into the system, we pump actual uh, carbon, primary uh, things, uh, crude oil, uh, coal, natural gas, into the system, and we trace it through th the whole production system so we can get the direct and the indirect uh, carbon content of, of products. But it's not your, your, your 
Uh, carbon content is not simply um, how much you use directly, but it's also the carbon embodied in the other things, that, the other stuff you use. Uh, the, uh, so some uh, quick points, slides, and here I'm going to take a leaf out of Lund Pritchard and just flip through some slides quickly, giving you an impression. Uh, the carbon within products, we find, uh, obviously, the uh, primary fuel producing uh, things are the most carbon intensive, Transformed energy, electricity is, is highly carbon intensive. And then we've got a whole lot of uh, products down there. One of the most interesting things that came out of this is um, the, the, the margins. In other words, the cost of getting the grid from, from factory to, to the market is act, are actually the, one of the main sources of, of carbon inputs. And you see the count for 7% of carbon within products. Um, if we look at carbon and exports, we actually find uh, South Africa, business in a way is, is right to be concerned. Carbon intensive uh, products are, are also ex export intensive. The, lar the large share, and you can see other mining there, which includes gold mining, it's a, it's a large uh, share of total exports, the size of the, of the bubble, uh, and it's got a high carbon intensity, uh, and it, uh, it, it's... Um, uh, export intensive. Most of its output is being export uh, things. So, so raising the price of carbon does affect exports. Uh, if we look at employment, and here we're doing a full employment multipliers, looking at, uh, at, at an input output way, it, it's actually less important. Uh, the, the big employers are not the same as the big carbon intensive uh, producers. Uh, when we look at households, uh, we see that household emissions are less than the national average compared to pr uh, production sectors. But looking at the goods they consume, uh, looking at the goods they consume, we find it's very uneven. Um, the poorest 20 percent, uh, uh, their, their, uh, their carbon consumption, if you like, is, is 0.3. Uh, of a ton of CO2 per year, which is equivalent to some very underdeveloped country like Benin. Uh, if we look at the richest 4% on the right-hand side, close to 40%, 40 tons uh, of, of CO2 per, per capita. So there's a very un, uneven distribution of carbon. So the question then comes, um, when, we, when we look at uh, the distribution of the carbon intensity. Uh, it, it depends, what we find is the lower income are mainly getting it because of the foods and fuels they use. Upper incomes are mainly because of the services and they consume a lot more electricity directly. And that's, that's where it's coming from. So our conclusion when, from this whole thing, we find a big range of carbon intensities across, across sectors and across products. Uh, the major exporters do have, exports do have a high carbon content. Uh, um, that raises issues of if you're introducing a carbon tax, should you have a border tax adjustment to try and uh, equalize things that, so that selling stuff locally uh, and um, actually giving a, giving a, a, taking the tax off when you export, rather like we do with VAT. Those kinds of issues come up for, to try and maintain competitiveness. Uh, I think there's something James was going to go into. The key employee, employment sectors tend to be less carbon intensive, and the middle income households tend to be more carbon intensive, uh, although the high income households uh, consume far more carbon than, than others. Um, the, so the concerns about uh, a carbon tax hitting the poor uh, households or maybe not quite as, as sharp as we might think they, they would be. That's pretty much what I want to say. Mm -hmm.